The Media Dialogues, Vision 2020. Across India, we are unlocking rapidly and simultaneously monitoring how this is stacking up in the battle against the coronavirus pandemic. The news, unfortunately, is not encouraging. Cases are soaring and India now has the fourth largest number of COVID-19 patients in the world. So how is the retail sector managing the reopening? And given that there's little appetite for discretionary expenditure, will it have to make long-term structural changes to survive? Let's find out from one of the most distinct retail brands in the country, built almost entirely by word of mouth. I'm talking about Fab India that started in 1960 as a single store and today operates 327 stores in 118 cities. It has 3.8 million customers on its loyalty program and its turnover last year was over a thousand crore rupees. I'm going to be talking to William Bissell, he's the chairman of Fab India, as well as Vinay Singh, the managing director of the company. Let's start with Vinay, who's joining us from the MG Road branch in Bengaluru. Vinay, it's good to see your store reopened and thank you for joining us on the show. Yeah, Andrade, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. And uh, I'm actually talking to you from our experience center, which is on MG Road in Bangalore. And I'm uh, so happy to share that we've so far been able to open 210 out of our 300. 28 stores. So about 65% of our stores are now functioning and we are getting customers walking in. Give us a sense of what a customer who walks in today will experience. Uh, are, you, are, are people allowed to touch, feel, try on, which are very big, uh, very, very big and essential in the categories that you serve? Yeah, actually the point that you've raised, Anuradha, is really, really vital, which is you know, safety. And when I talk about safety, I'm talking about safety both from the staff point of view sure. and from the customer point of view. And at the first level, there is a set of protocols which covers all the basic requirements. So, you know, the usual taking temperatures, wearing masks, wearing gloves, uh, social distancing, right? Uh, sanit hand sanitizers, so all that. Then we've got things like trial room protocols, which we believe are very important. So, which involves things like I mean, if a customer wants to try a garment, uh, the garment is tea mined hmm. and then handed over to the customer to go and try. When the customer goes into the trial room uh, to prevent the airborne aerosol, we have these HOCL vaporizers. So the, the trial room gets sprayed with this to sort of disinfect or sanitize hmm. The, hmm. the trial rooms. Similarly, once the garments have been worn and they, before they get put back to the racks, Yes, team mind. Uh, what kind of footfalls are you seeing on an average across these stores uh, that are open? And uh, also, what kind of behavior are you seeing? Are you seeing anxiety? Are you seeing less, uh, you know, a, a lesser desire to try on clothes, to, uh, to shop for apparel? In terms of the footfalls, I would say that we are at about 20-25% of normal. Right. The good news is that the conversions are much higher. So, oh, you know, people okay. who are coming to the stores are coming with the intent more. to buy. So, it's so, not you really... know, the bill values have gone up. Yeah. They're coming with the intent to buy. Yes. We've also come out with a lot of, you know, new initiatives to see that we're able to engage with customers better. So, we've, we've put in place uh, like a very strong, we've strengthened our omni-channel platform mm -hmm. and we've put in place an outbound sell selling protocol. So, we call it a white glove service. So, with having done these, we find that our, if you look at our overall sales for these 210 stores, they're at about 40% of normal. Basically, the store teams become like relationship managers, you know, actually mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they reach out to customers, they do deliveries at home, they do trials at home, they fix appointments in the stores, they send a lot of material to them through WhatsApp, you know, lookbooks, catalogs, etc. Mm -hmm. So, this is... You know, it's a completely different way of working. We never used to do things like yes. this. So this white glove service, is this something that's here to stay? Uh, or is this, some, is, is this an interim uh, measure? We launched a loyalty program called Fab Family, uh, which we did about a year ago. And this was actually part of the program. It just so happened that, you know, because of the lockdown, we sort of pre-pawned it and we then, you know, put it into uh, process a little earlier than we had earlier scheduled. But it's a very important part. There is a lot of traction happening on online. So our, our uh, 
we see a lot of new customers coming on to our website fabindia.com hmm. uh, so that is a big shift we are doing a lot of online deliveries from our stores so that you know it's more cost effective we can make deliveries quicker will you see a contraction of stores will you see you guys going back to the drawing board and saying you know we don't need so many physical stores is that what i'm hearing there's not going to be any physical shrinking of stores so i think i mean in fact i see that you know there's still a lot of opportunity we have to to expand and to open far more number of stores so that will happen but i think the the main the key change that will happen is that the stores will become the the channels and the mode of selling is going to change dramatically we are hearing these days of something of this phenomenon called revenge uh, revenge shopping or revenge buying and we've seen some display of that in china with luxury goods is that something that you see playing out at all uh, at your end i don't think we've seen that phenomena of what people call revenge buying and i've been reading also a lot about that but what i'd like to highlight is you know some some interesting trends that we are seeing at a broader level uh, what we are finding is that you know there is more traction towards the the middle and the lower price points mm. uh, the other thing is that you know because customers are spending so much of time at home so we find a quite a surge in the demand for our home products mm. Mm. so you know across the board for you know most of our home products so whether it's utility products which is all your bed bath table yes. linen or you know like people are doing a lot more cooking at home so mm. you know the the cookware the tableware mm. uh, there's a lot of work from home happening so everything to do with work from home to make your work from home space more comfortable right uh, you know accent pieces of furniture mm. table lamps uh, sure. shelves sure uh, and you know that way fortunately we are quite well positioned to handle that because we've got quite a big range similarly on the on the apparel side we find a lot of interest more towards the basics mm. the essentials more the comfort and the leisure and of course then you know there are all the essential products which right. are moving well so right. all the food products so we have all the organic foods yes the health supplements and then we've got the personal care range a lot of surveys that have been monitoring how people are likely to spend have suggested that these will be hit quite hard because these are discretionary and these will recover over you know will take at least 6 8 months maybe even to recover to pre covid levels of normalcy uh, are you seeing that being borne out with your experience at fab india yes i think that is very true anuradha and you know i completely agree with that and that's what we are also seeing because you know i mean again uh, customer sentiment overall has been very very severely impacted and you know i mean it's very clear that it's going to take a long time for that to recover we all know that you know income levels yes. have overall dropped sharply yes so you know there is uh, you know people are obviously you know spending far more on essentials and you know far less on discretionary items and categories like ours so so we are finding that but i mean my point was more about that within our categories sure so within apparel and within home we are seeing uh, you know decent traction happening around these sort of uh, you know these particular customer needs now the retail sector that fab india sits within has been in the front line of the kind of you know disruptive and destructive impact that covid has wreaked on our economy uh you know we know that some 60 lakh people may have lost their jobs in this sector what has the three months been like for you at fab india vinay all retail has been running on zero revenues for a very extended period of time yes uh you know there really hasn't been very much of support that the retail sector has been able to get by way of any direct benefits for for the staff uh like you pointed out that you know the sector it employs something like 40 50 million people if you look at you know i mean the direct and indirect employment that it generates and uh, without these direct uh, subsidies uh we will be you know losing about something like nearly 25% of these jobs i think by the time we get through the the next phase and the revival phase uh, of this business so so that's a you know so that's that's a difficult part uh that you know we've all been faced with fab india has a loyal bunch of customers who don't don't seem just to buy the design aesthetic but also uh, so, you know sort of seem to understand that here are indian products 
made, created by Indian artisans. So there is a direct impact on the rural and semi-rural economy that Fab India has. What is your sense of uh, how it has impacted this community, which is the artisan and the skill-based crafts communities who make up the rural and semi-rural economy, which is beyond the agricultural economy or on the periphery of the agricultural economy? I think as far as uh, you know, the craft sector is concerned, uh, it is very, very critical that, you know, we keep them occupied because, you know, if you don't keep them occupied, then, you know, I mean, all their artisans uh, will obviously have to look at some alternate forms of livelihood. So that is a huge challenge that we face. And uh, so even from our side, uh, what we've tried to do is that even though we have zero sales at this point in time, but uh, we try and we've tried to sustain sure. as much of the orders as we can from you know the craftspeople across different parts of the country so we've we've done some deferments we've tried to minimize cancellations of orders we started doing these staggered payments to uh, the vendors uh, every couple of weeks we were releasing payments then the next challenge was how to make sure that their curigars and their tailors were being used and the craftspeople were being used uh, because you know the regular production had stopped so that's the time when, you know, we heard about, uh, first of all, the shortage of these disposable coveralls for the frontline health, for the frontline yes. health workers. So we then took some of our bigger vendors who would got bigger capacities uh, to start making these disposable coveralls. And uh, we decided to donate 100,000 uh, coveralls for medical workers through the ministry. So that was one thing which we did for the bigger vendors, for the smaller vendors uh, who couldn't ha handle that level of complexity. Uh, we decided to start manufacturing cloth masks. Sure. The other point which you made is that, you know, also from a, from a customer point of view, uh, I have to say that, you know, there is, a, there is clearly, you know, recognition of supporting local products, you know, supporting local communities, supporting local crafts. So that has also been a tremendous help. Fab India is a brand that has never seen a brand related big splash campaign or advertising. Do you see that going to change in the coming months? No, I don't think we'll be doing any big bank campaigns. I think I, that's never really been part of Fab India. Yes. But what we're doing is, I think the focus really has shifted far more onto uh, customer relationship management. That is really where the focus is. Vinay, thank you very much. We wish you and your team a lot of good luck as you start opening up across the country and adapt Fab India to the new realities. Thank you, Anuradha. Thank you very much for having me on your show. And now let's go across to Delhi to join William Bissell, the chairman of Fab India. William, thank you so much for joining us. I know how difficult it is to pin you down for conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anuradha. It's been a while since I've been chatting with you and I really enjoyed our last interaction and I think that the times, the circumstances were very different then. A lot of talk about how COVID-19 is going to fundamentally change us as a society perhaps and in the way we do business. What do you see as some of the long-term structural changes that business will have to undergo as a result of this never before experience? I think it's important that you, you brought that up Anuradha because COVID is two things. It's it's an event and it's a process. The event is, of course, what we're all going through right now. But we all know that by next year, hopefully sooner rather than later, there will be a vaccine. There will be some treatment. Cases will start in the next few months peaking out, leveling off. So that will mean that the storm has passed. But the changed landscape will be with us for a very long time. I think that a lot of business people are thinking that once this COVID is over, they'll go back to business as, as they say, as normal. You are not seeing us able to go back to a pre-COVID normal at all. No, the landscape will have changed significantly. And businesses that believe they can go back to that familiar landscape are going to find themselves at a risk for being out of business. It's, it's I mean, if you go back to the familiar, you end up, risking your whole business. So you have to find the new normal. And, and that's going to be a very difficult process for most businesses. I'll give you an example. We, uh, once COVID is over, we will not need 80% of our office spaces. Wow, so, that's... so we have learned yeah. to work 
without that. Now imagine if tens of thousands of businesses do this, what it does to commercial real estate. So all these changes are going to happen in the pre post COVID landscape. And that's going to be a place where um, a lot of economic dislocation can take place, but there will be tremendous opportunities also. When you say that there will be some opportunities, it would be lovely to hear what you think could be opportunities. I think that uh, the biggest possible opportunity for us to recognize is that we are independent and interdependent at the same time. I mean, it's a little, but what I'm trying to say is that we depend on our customers, our landlords depend on us, and in that way, we have we have a cycle of interdependence, and we have a very very strong cycle of interdependence in everything we do. And I think if if business leaders start recognizing that, and right, working with say governments, working with communities, working with their employees, working across the spectrum, and just on just recognizing the fact that we have tremendous interdependencies in our system, and we will be able to forge partnerships outside, you know, from that recognition. And those partnerships are going to be key to the survival. I told a landlord this, I said, we're in a lifeboat together. You know, I mean, we can either fight in that lifeboat and tip it over and then we both sink. Yeah. Or we can recognize that the storms are not of our making. Sure. One of the storms we are facing is COVID. But another storm we're facing is the rapid rise of e-commerce. And e-commerce can render, you know, traditional retail totally obsolete. So we said to the landlords, said, look, if you're willing to partner with us, we'll make you a partner in, in the white glove service. We'll make you a partner for our e-commerce local sales. We'll make you a partner for our in-store sales. But let's look at this as a partnership because that's the only way we will be able to survive. So I think that just like that, there are going to be lots of businesses are going to have to look for partnerships emerging out of a, a recognition of how interdependent we all are. The government has taken several steps. The central government has announced several packages. Uh, what more do you think the government can do to deal with a post-COVID scenario where business is concerned? Anuradha, unlike European governments or governments in the US, um, we are in a very difficult situation because the first priority of the government, and it's rightly so, is the first priority is to look after those who are the least fortunate among us. Sure. You know, and... Uh, so, whereas in, in many European companies, uh, countries, governments have gone and helped businesses, uh, yes, businesses. I don't think that in India we should be a priority of the government. I mean, I think the government's primary priority, and that is what the government has been doing consistently, is to help the poorest, help those that are least, most disadvantages, um, and help them find livelihoods. So, where does that leave the business community, you'd say? And I'd say that, you know, uh, one feature of this uh, crisis globally is that there's a vast amount of capital that is sloshing around the world. Last report I read said there's around $70 trillion of capital that is sloshing around the world mm. looking for a home. Now, a lot of people want to invest in India. They believe that, you know, as economies emerge from this, India will be a very big player in the new world order and i and i also share the same belief i think that that this century is going to be largely for countries like india to take a leadership role what that means uh, from government policy is that there have been two missions in the west um one is of differential voting right companies and the other one is what I call protected cell companies. Right. In around the 60s and 70s, the idea started the 1960s and 70s of differential voting rights. And this was to allow entrepreneurs yes. to be able to control the voting shares of their company. Even and, though yet, the and yet access capital. And yet access capital. And, you know, I was recently talking to a businessman and asking them why they moved their business to Singapore from India. And he said, you know, in India, we are fighting I know I'm a great entrepreneur, but I'm fighting guys with machine guns with bows and arrows. Sure, sure. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, they can raise unlimited amount of capital. capital. They have unlimited amount of ammunition. Whereas every time I take on an investor, I dilute. Hmm. And, and he says, if I keep diluting at this rate, I will own 6% of my company. You know, in other countries, sure. because of the differential voting rights structure, they're able to you know, like Amazon now has class C shares. They have class A, class B, class C. Yes. And each share has a differential voting yeah. right. 
So I believe in the business of Amazon and believe that there's a rosy future for it. I buy class B or C shares. I'm not concerned with buying class A shares. I'm coming in as a pension fund or I'm coming in as an investor and I'll, and I'll exit. I think if we were to bring this innovation to Indian corporate law, I would say trillions of dollars will flow into India because people recognize the brilliance and you know, the incredible strategic capacity of Indian entrepreneurs to innovate, to constantly innovate and to find new ways of doing things. And this is what the Prime Minister said when he's talked about Atmanirbhar Bharat. Given the current disruption in this consu in the consumption story that India is seeing, and while it's very important, how has Fab India seen this evolve over the years, the way Indians are consuming? It's not just an aesthetic, it's also what you empower when you make the Fab India consumption choice. Uh, how do you see this evolving in a post-COVID scenario? So there are two parts to your question, Anurag. On the first part, I... I would beg to disagree. I think the Indian consumption story doesn't have to stop for three years or four years like economists are saying. I believe if we can bring capital to work in India, entrepreneurs here, the, the level of entrepreneurship is so great here that they will be able to quickly transform that and use that to reignite the economy. Instead of going to the government to look for capital, with some changes in the law, actually the capital will just flow into India and you know that capital that flows in will create tremendous employment and will revive economic growth and i'm sure that with that you know our economic growth we will go back to being you know the world's number one fastest growing economy right to go back to where the consumer is going to be you know i think that a lot will depend on the opportunities we are all everybody around the world all consumers act the same way when you feel good about the future, when you're going to get a promotion, when your spouse is getting an increment, you buy a house, you buy a bigger car, you feel good about the future. That expenditure, that discretionary income expenditure translates into more income for businesses. They in turn start to invest, they employ more people and, and that very, very happy cycle begins. We're in the other end of that, which is a spiral where people lose their jobs. Yes. They, the future is uncertain incomes are uncertain their emis are weighing very heavily upon them this is a huge burden so what do they do they do the same thing in every country from you know from peru to i mean senegal to everywhere they just put the brakes on they just stop spending how do you see the indian consumer uh, via the fab india lens uh, behave in the days going forward and by that i mean i do i don't mean it in terms of the ability to consume or consumption expenditure but just in terms of an approach to consumption you know i, I was talking to somebody recently who had um, applied for a job and he said you know i the last couple of months i realized that what i've been doing for the last 15 years in my life doesn't give me any happiness. I don't feel like I'm doing anything that makes the world a better place. I know it sounds like a cliche, but I think a lot of people are rather asking them that those themselves those questions and saying, you know, I really want to make a difference in the world. I really want to have a purpose to my work, my life. And I think this period of the lockdown has helped people reflect on what's really important for them in their lives. And I think a lot of good will come off that. I don't know what exactly will happen, but I think a lot of good will come off that. Okay, I, I like the fact that you believe a lot of good will come out of that. That is an optimistic note to end this conversation on. Thank you very much, William Bissell, for joining us. Stay safe and hopefully we'll be able to pin you down for another conversation face to face once we are out of all of this. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Anuradha. Good luck. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back again with another conversation on the Media Dialogues on CNBC TV 18. So stay tuned. The Media Dialogues, Vision 2020.